board. I'm happy to have you here. Happy to uh, share this moment with you. Uh, we're amid the uh, COVID pandemic, so a, a trying time in our history. And I believe that it would be beneficial for millions and millions of us out there to figure out where to take your career. What career should you choose? Which path should you take? It is a very challenging question. It is a very difficult question because we're talking about doing something for the entirety of your life. So it's, it's a tremendous commitment and it is something that we struggle with when we're considering the ultimate question, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? So I have had the privilege of working in the field that I love my entire life. I've, um, every dollar I've made has been through this uh, medium of uh, the aviation field in some way or another. I've uh, flown many, many different types of aircraft and started making money in aviation when I was 18 years old, flying as a, um, as a flight instructor, uh, teaching others how to fly because I started really young. So I feel that uh, over the course of my life, I've had the opportunity to help many friends and acquaintances in helping them decide their career path. So I have put together a set of notes that I believe will definitely be of value if you're asking yourself this very lifelong important question and uh, we're going to try to provide you some very material, key, insightful, as I like to call them, golden nuggets, uh, things that you can effectively use to help you make that choice. So. Where do we start? I, I think we have three categories of people. Ultimately, those who have a calling, those who have a strong interest in many uh, different areas, perhaps one more so than others, and those who have no idea of what they're going to do. If you fall into one of the categories of you have no idea, that makes you normal. That's basically the absolute majority of the population. So we're definitely going to address that. No matter which group you're in, there are some fundamentals that I believe uh, do yield uh, long-term, uh, if, if I dare say, happiness out of your decision. The number one is meaning. Whenever you choose something that you find meaningful, it is, uh, th there are good chances that you will derive uh, a tremendous amount of satisfaction and happiness from that career and that job that you see as being meaningful. So whatever that might be uh, for you, that will likely yield a long-term satisfaction. It definitely helps choosing something that you're really good at. Whenever there's a performance difference between you and the competition, that will likely yield in progress and it will yield in satisfaction. Those go hand in hand with you being happy and that creates a long-term progress. So I've been flying um, airplanes for 20 years, uh, 19 in fact, and I've been uh, transporting passengers with the airlines for 15 years and I'm just as happy as I was day one. Um, still dedicated, still uh, study routinely, uh, learning new airplanes, and it, it is a vastly complex field. So I can study for you know my whole life and not know everything about it, which is wonderful. A very complex field uh, generates a lot of opportunities for learning and progression. So uh, let's address those categories a little bit more specifically. Those who have a calling and know exactly what they want to do, wonderful. That was the category in which I was in. Uh, but it's not that simple. You're not done. You do have to consider paying your bills. So for example, say you want to be an artist. Uh, but the majority of artists really are not having an easy time uh, they're having a difficult time making ends meet, right? There are many callings that will not necessarily yield the economic return necessary for you to have the life that you want. 
So we're gonna go a little bit more in depth into the financial aspect of it here in just a minute, but that's something to consider. So you know what you want. Now you need to figure out if you don't succeed greatly in that field, can you still provide for yourself and perhaps a family the quality of life that you seek? Next group of people would be those with many different interests. So you like one field, but you also like that field, and you also like that field. So how do you choose? One great way to think about it is we all tend to rather easily know what we do not like to do. We're pretty good at that, uh, saying, oh, if I were to stay in a cubicle nine to five, I would hate my life. Or if I was to work from midnight to six in the morning, I would hate my life. Or, you know, different, infinite different aspects of it. But that which you do not like is probably rather obvious to you. Go ahead and write those down. When you're writing down what you don't like, probably the opposite of it is something that you do like. So go ahead and make two lists, things that you don't like and things that you do like. And if your do not like list is huge and your like list is small, this is not a failure, this is wonderful. You know you cannot do all of those things, which is extremely valuable if you're looking at the long-term commitment, okay? Then the last group is the, the group, which is the absolute majority, that you just don't have any idea what you want to do. So when it comes to that group, I, uh, I, I do recommend uh, making the following analysis. You may not know what you, don't, uh, what you want to do. However, you probably know the kind of life that you would like to have. And the kind of life that you would like to have is provided by a certain type of job. So it is an economic decision. It's all about the numbers. Our lives are ruled by our monetary system and it may not necessarily yield happiness directly at work, but it will provide for the kind of life that you want. So I did run as lots of numbers. I did quite a bit of research to provide you with meaningful information that you can use. Ran several numbers on, 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 on calculators, on mortgage calculators. And I, I thought about it for a while, trying to find something that is a common ground among all of us. So we all need a place to live, right? Not all of us like cars, not all of us like the beach, not all of us like this or that, but we do like a house. We do need to live in an apartment, a house, or something like that. We do need housing. And that incurs, uh, for the absolute majority of the population, the greatest cost of living, expense, that we acquire through, most commonly, a mortgage loan. So if you were to run some numbers and look at how much salary do you need to afford a $100,000 house, $250,000 house, half a million dollar house, what would those numbers be? Well, I ran some estimates and all these numbers accounted for 20% down payment, a very low interest rate, which is where we're at today. And then I gave it a little bit of a buffer and I added what would be a probable total tax demand deduction from your salary as a buffer. So we can translate the cost of the house into salary. That way, you know what kind of salary you need to make for the kind of house that you want to buy. This is very useful because we're trying to go from the theoretical to the practical. What can we do here? So if you're looking at a $100,000 house, about $15,000 of your yearly salary will be dedicated to paying that house. Mind you, to purchase that $100,000 house, 
in ideal circumstances uh, doing what is known as a conventional loan so that you would not have to take what's called a PMI, which is an insurance on that loan, you do need 20% down payment, like I said earlier. Thereabouts, give or take, not exact. But that would yield about $20,000 in that case. So you finance the 80. And then you run the numbers like I just kind of summarized, you get about $15,000. So 15,000 is committed just to your house. If you're at $250,000, you're looking at more like 25,000 for owning that house. Again, this is your actual salary pre-tax, not the money that is going to enter your account. This is before all the deductions. At half a million, you're looking at $45,000 worth of salary per year that is completely dedicated to your house. So being mindful that this doesn't include living your life, everything else, your cars, insurance, food, clothing, any vacations, anything that you want to do, any shopping. So I do keep that in mind. Um, $750,000, you're looking at about $70,000 a year. And at a million, you're looking at $85,000 per year of salary committed to paying for your house and do keep in mind to buy the million dollar house, you're gonna have to put $200,000 cash in order to bring that loan down to 800,000. So obviously that's on the higher end of the scale, but it is important that we talk about the progression uh, from a rather beginning of the scale to a little bit higher end of the scale. Again, it does go lower, it does go higher but we're looking at uh, one that would encompass the majority of the population so that we can actually look at what kind of salaries you want and evaluate it that way. So a great resource, again, no affiliation, but for you, for you to utilize would be like salary.com. So you look at how much salary you need for the house. The next would be what are you? What kind of lifestyle are you looking to have? Are you doing one, two vacations a year? Are your kids going to private school? What kind of cars do you want to drive? And then you just tally those up and you keep on adding and be very generous because odds are the generous uh, account uh, numbers will be more accurate and reflecting most likely what you will encounter as far as expenses are concerned. I will be providing links down below in the video regarding the many different um, uh, sources that I utilized to come up with the numbers that I will be, that I've provided thus far and I'll be providing more for you just for your own reference and for you to see it uh, for yourself. So one key concept to understand is in this financial realm of things is that the increase in cost of living is not directly proportional to your income. It is, in fact, an exponential curve. So what do I mean by that? So if you have a $100,000 house, you will be parking a certain type of car in front of that house, right? When you're at half a million, odds are you're going to be parking a different type of car in front of that house, and at a million, it'll be even more different than at half a million. Why is that important? Because you have to look at the entire picture, not just a small fraction of the picture. So the more you look at the whole picture, the more holistic is your analysis, the closer it will be to the real answer that you're looking for. And while we're talking about this, it is extremely important to talk about tax rates. Just briefly, we'll go over how this actually works. Because if you're down here making about twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars, and your tax rate is three, four, five percent, if you think you're going to get a five percent deduction when you're making two hundred and fifty thousand dollars your numbers are gonna be incredibly off because that is not true. The data I've accrued has come straight from the source, straight from IRS, so they're the ones collecting the money. 
I'm getting the numbers from them and uh, relaying it to you. I, I, I don't see a spin on this number. This is just the data. I've been trying to keep it anecdotal so you can get the raw data and uh, we can work with good numbers. But uh, essentially, the top percent of Americans will pay about 37% of the entire IRS revenue uh, for personal income, which is more than the bottom 50%. Another way to look at it, the top 50% together pays 97% of all the taxes. And the bottom 50% pays a cumulative only 3% of the burden. And I speak from personal experience. Uh, when I started working, I was making less than $20,000 a year. And this is not in the 80s. Uh, so really low level income for a very high expense career that hopefully will bear fruit. Unfortunately, COVID is really throwing a wrench on that right now. But um, you start really low at a place where it didn't make any sense to be a pilot and then you progress up. So when I'm speaking of this, these numbers and I'm telling you these things, I'm actually sharing with you not just the data straight from the IRS, but from personal experience, my own tax returns that I did throughout the years. Uh, your tax rate, effective tax rate, what you actually paid in taxes is minuscule when you're down low, not making much money. And as you go up, more and more uh, deductions get canceled out because you're making enough money. So there is this, there are many, many, many lies that we're told on a routinely basis by different sources, whether written or TV and what have you, that are just blatant lies. And one of them is that the rich don't pay any taxes. Well, that's, that's not true. The numbers will show you that that is not true. Now, you know, don't, is the millionaire doing bad? No, he's not doing bad, but he is, you know, they are paying. Again, the top 50% does pay for 97%, and the top percent does pay for 37% of the taxes, the entire revenue. Now, they obviously make most of the money, so it is in correlation with the income. So obviously do keep that in mind. Uh, that is a factor as, as we're analyzing these numbers. So as you're looking at all of this and you're thinking, well, how does this have, what does this have to do with me selecting your career? Well, it all ties back to, okay, you don't want to do anything at all. That's, that's normal, that, that you don't want to go to work, again, that's, that's most people. And you don't know what you want to do, but you do know that kind of lifestyle that you want. So say your lifestyle is a $150,000 lifestyle. Now, again, a little caveat here, this differs greatly depending on where you are in the country, right? If you're in New York at 100, in Manhattan at $150,000, I'm, I'm not, I haven't run the numbers in Manhattan, but I, I do know people that live there. I'm pretty confident that would put you uh, close to the bottom there. I mean, a studio will be an obscene amount. I saw an apartment there once that was, uh, it was a thousand square feet and it was 1.1 million. Yeah, so that's a thing, right? But if you're in the Midwest, you know, and there isn't much around you, $150,000 will take you very far. So as you're making these analysis, right, this is a very complex analysis because you does need to take into consideration where you want to live, which totally skews the equation. That being said, we do have to talk about something concrete that we can work with, right? So when taking all these things into consideration, say a $150,000 salary, which jobs pay that money? That's the ultimate question. What job do I need to have that will yield the life that I want to have for myself and perhaps my family? Single income household, two income household, 
Those make a huge impact in the finances and in the family dynamics as a whole. Think of kids growing up with the parents, without the parents. Again, pros and cons, whichever way you look at it. Uh, like I said, it, it is a complicated decision. But it is a conversation that has to be had, especially today, in today's environment that we have here, which is very challenging. And I will be addressing aviation-specific career development uh, that is obviously going through a very rough patch at the present time, myself included, even though I've been flying for a very long time, experiencing tremendous financial hardship as a byproduct of COVID. The aviation industry was, well... It was shut down. Uh, it is coming back slowly. And if it doesn't come back, it will mostly go bankrupt. So when all those things are taken into consideration, I would like to leave you with this idea that, you know, most people just don't want to do anything in particular. Well, if you want to be... Uh, well, you don't want to be, I should say. I shouldn't say that. But if you're going to be miserable while you're at work, at least cry in your Porsche on the way home to your lake house. Meaning, if you don't want to do anything in particular, at least make money. Because if money is coming in at a high rate, if you're making a good amount of money, maybe your day-to-day -day work life is not fun, but you can have a lot of fun outside of work and you know it's like the country song right so money doesn't buy you happiness but it does buy you the boat that buy you know that goes on the lake that buys you the lake house <laughs> and that buys you happiness so do keep that in mind as you're making those decisions and that is uh, what i wanted to leave you with uh, here today was uh just some concrete advice regarding salary selection career selection and where to go from here so definitely appreciate you uh, tuning in. Like and subscribe and stay tuned for the next video. Thank you very much.